Chapter 11 of the Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin by Benjamin Franklin. Chapter 11 Interest in Public Affairs. I begin now to turn my thoughts a little to public affairs, beginning, however, with small matters. The city watch was one of the first things that I convinced to want regulation. It was managed by the constables of the respective wards in turn. The constable warmed a number of housekeepers to attend him for the night. Those who chose never to attend paid him six shillings a year to be excused which was supposed to be for hiring substitutes, but was, in reality, much more than was necessary for that purpose, and made the constableship a place of profit. And the constable, for a little drink, often got such ragamuffins about him as a watch that respectable housekeepers did not choose to mix with. Walking that rounds, too, was often neglected, and most of the night spent in tippling. I thereupon wrote a paper to be read in Junto, representing these irregularities, by insisting more particularly of the inequality of six of shilling tax of the constables, respecting the circumstances of those who paid it, since a poor widow housekeeper, all whose property to be guarded by the watch did not perhaps exceed the value of fifty pounds, paid as much as the wealthiest merchant who had thousands of pounds worth of goods in his stores. On the whole, I was proposed as more effectual watch, the hiring of a proper man to serve constantly in that business, and as a more equitable way of supporting the charge, the levying a tax that should be proportioned to the property. This idea, being approved by the Junto, was communicated to the other clubs, but as arching in each of them, and though the plan was not immediately carried into execution, yet, by preparing the minds of people for the charge, they paved the way for the law obtained in a few years after, when the members of our clubs were grown into more influence. About this time I wrote a paper, first to be read in Junto, but it was afterward published, on the different accidents and carelessness by which houses were set on fire, with cautions against them and means proposed of avoiding them. This was most spoken as a useful piece, and gave rise to a project, which soon followed, of forming a company for the more ready extinguishing of fires, and mutual assistance in removing and securing goods when in danger. Associates in this scheme were presently found amounting to thirty. Our articles of agreement obliged every member to keep always in good order, and fit for use, a certain number of leather buckets with strong bags and baskets, for packing and transporting of goods, which were to be brought to every fire, and we agreed to much months in a month, and spent a social evening together, in discoursing and communicating such ideas as occurred to us upon the subjects of fires, as might be useful in our conduct or such occasions. The utility of this institution soon appeared, and many more desiring to be admitted than we thought convenient for one company. They were advised to form another, which was accordingly done, and this went on, one new company being informed after another, till they became so numerous as to include most of the inhabitants, who were men of property, and now, at the time of my writing this, though upward of fifty years since its establishment, that which I first formed, called the Union Fire Company, still subsists and flourishes, though the first members are all descendants by it myself and one, who is older by a year than I am. The small fines that have been paid by members for absence at the monthly meetings have been applied to the purchase of fire engines, ladders, fire hooks, and other useful implements for each company, so that I question whether there is a city in the world provided with the means of putting a stop to beginning conflagrations, 
and in fact since these institutions the city has never lost by fire more than one or two houses at a time and the flames have gone often been extinguished before the house in which they began has been half consumed in seventeen thirty nine arrived among us from ireland the rev mr whitefield a footnote george whitefield pronounced hootfield seventeen fourteen to seventeen seventy a celebrated englishman clergyman and pulpit orator one of the founders of methodism and a footnote who had made himself remarkable there as an inherent preacher he was at first permitted to preach in some of our churches but the clergy taking a dislike to him soon refused him their pulpits and he was obliged to preach in the fields the multitudes of all sects and denominations that attended his sermons were enormous and it was matter of speculation to me who was one of the number to observe the extraordinary influence of his oratory of his hearers and how much they admired and respected him notwithstanding his comments abuse of them by assuring them they were all naturally half beasts and half devils it was wondered to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion it seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street and it being found inconvenient to assemble in open air subject to the inclemencies the building of a house to meet in was no sooner proposed than persons appointed to receive contributions but sufficient sums were soon received to procure the ground and erect the building which was one hundred feet long and seventy broad about the size of westminster hall a footnote a part of the palace of westminster now forming the vestibule to the houses of parliament of london and, a footnote. and the work was carried on with such spirit as to be finished in a much stronger time than could have been expected both house and ground were vested in trustees expressly for the use of any preacher of any religious persuasion who might desire to say something to the people at philadelphia the design in the building not being to accommodate any particular sect but the inhabitants in general so that even if the mutfi or constantinople were to send a missionary to preach mohammedism to us he'd find a pulpit at his service mr whitefield in leaving us went preaching all the way through the colonies to georgia the settlement of that province had lately been begun but instead of being made with hardy industrious husbandmen accustomed to labor the only people fit for such an enterprise it was the families of broken shopkeepers and other insolvent debtors many of indolent and idle habits taken out of the jails who being set down in the woods unqualified for carrying land and able, unable to endure the hardships of a new settlement perished in numbers leaving many helpless children unprovided for the sight of their miserable situation inspired the benevolent heart mr whitefield with the idea of building an orphan house there in which they might be supported and educated returning northward he preached up to this charity and made large collections for his eloquence had a wonderful power over the hearts and purses of his hearers of which i myself was an instance i did not disapprove of the design but as georgia when the destitute of materials and workmen and it was proposed to send them from philadelphia at a great expense i thought it would have been better to have built the house here and brought the children to it this i advised with but he was resolute in his first project rejected my counsel and i therefore refused to contribute i happened soon after to attend one of his sermons in the course of which i perceived he intended to finish with a collection and i silently resolved he should get nothing from me i had in my pocket a handful of copper money three or four silver dollars and five pistols in gold as he proceeded i began to soften and concluded to give the coppers another stroke of his oratory made me ashamed of that and determined me to give the silver and he finished so admirably that i emptied my pocket wholly into the collector's dish gold and all at this sermon there was also one of the, our club who being of my sentiments respecting the building in georgia 
and suspecting a collection might be intended had by precaution emptied his pockets before he came from home towards the conclusion of the discourse however he felt a strong desire to give and applied to a neighbour who stood near him to borrow some money for the purpose the application was unfortunately made to perhaps the only man in the company who had the firmness not to be affected by the preacher his answer was at any other time a friend hopkinson i would lend to thee freely but not now for thee seems to be out of thy senses some of mr whitefield's enemies affected to suppose that he would apply these collectors to his own private emolument but i who was intimately acquainted with him being employed in printing his sermons and journals etc never had the least suspicion of his integrity but am to this day decidedly of opinion that he was in all his conduct a perfectly honest man and methinks my testimony in his favour ought to have the more weight as we have no religious connection he must indeed sometimes to pray for my conversion but never had the satisfaction of believing that his prayers were heard ours was a mere civil friendship sincere on both sides and lasted to his death the following instance will show something of the terms on which we stood upon one of his arrivals from england at boston he wrote to me that he should come soon to philadelphia but knew not where he could lodge when there as he understood his old friend and host mr benisset was removed to garmentown my answer was you know my house if you can make shift with its scanty accommodations you will be most heartily welcome he replied that if i made that kind offer for christ's sake i should not miss a reward and i returned don't let me be mistaken it was not for christ's sake but for your sake one of our common acquaintances jocosely remarked that knowing it to be the custom of the saints when they received any favour to shift the burden of the obligation from one off their own shoulders and place it in heaven i had contrived to fix it on earth the last time i saw mr whitefield was in london when he consulted me about his orphan house concern and his purpose of appropriating it to the establishment of a college he had a loud and clear voice and articulated his words and sentences so perfectly that he might be heard and understood at a great distance especially as his auditories however numerous observed the most exact silence he preached one evening from the top of the courthouse steps which are in the middle of mark street and on the west side of second street which crosses it at right angles both streets were filled with the harriers to a considerable distance being among the hindmost in market street i had the curiosity to learn how far he could be heard by retiring backwards down the street towards the river and i found his voice distinct till i came near front street when some noise in that street obscured it imagining them a semicircle of which my distance should be the radius and that it were filled with auditors to each of whom i allowed two square feet i computed that he might well be heard by more than thirty thousand this reconciled me to the newspaper accounts of his having preached to twenty-five thousand people in the fields and to the ancient histories of generals haranguing whole armies of which i had sometimes doubted by hearing him often i came to distinguish easily between sermons newly composed and those which he had often preached in course of his travels his delivery of the latter was so improved by frequent repetitions that every accent every emphasis every modulation of voice was so perfectly well turned and well placed that without being interested in the subject one could not help being pleased with the discourse a pleasure of much the same kind with that received from an excellent piece of music this is an advantage interned preachers have over those who are stationary as the latter cannot well improve their delivery of a sermon by so many rehearsals his writing and printing from time to time gave great advantage to his enemies unguarded expressions and even erroneous opinions delivered in preaching might have been afterwards explained or qualified by supposing others that might have accompanied them or they might have been denied but litera scripta manet 
critics attacked his writing violently and with so much appearance of reason as to diminish the number of his votaries and prevent their increase so that i am of opinion if he had never written anything he would have left behind him a much more numerous and important sect and his reputation might in that case have been still growing even after his death as there being nothing of his writing on which to found a censure and to give him a lower character his proletes would be left at liberty to feign for him as great a variety of excellences as their enthusiastic admiration might wish him to have possessed my business was now continually augmenting and my circumstances growing daily easier my newspaper having become very profitable as being from a time almost the only one in this and the neighboring provinces i experienced too the truth of observation that after getting the first hundred pound it is more easy to get the second money itself being of a prolific nature the partnership at carolina having succeeded i was encouraged to engage in others and to promote several of my workmen who had behaved well by establishing them with printing-houses in different colonies on the same terms with that in carolina most of them did well being enabled at the end of our term six years to purchase the types of me to go on working for themselves by which means several families were raised partnerships often finish in quarrels but i was happy in this that mine were all carried on and ended amicably owning i think a good deal to the precaution of having very explicitly settled in our articles everything to be done by or expected from each partner so that there was nothing to dispute which precaution i would therefore recommend to all who enter into partnerships for whatever esteem partners may have for and confidence in each other at the time of the contract little jealousies and disgusts may arise with ideas of inequality in the care and burden of the business etc which are attended often with breach of friendship and of the connection perhaps with lawsuits and other disagreeable consequences end of chapter fifteen read by elijah fisher